if you ask me what I would do in the next time I found a company, I would definitely hire a very, very good HR person as one of the first 10 employees. So someone can really own this process of hiring the right people and finding them and like talking to uh, prospects very early in the process. Do you want to impact the world and still turn a profit? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to Growth Everywhere. This is the show where you'll find real conversations with real entrepreneurs. They'll share everything from their biggest struggle to the exact strategies they use on a daily basis. So if you're ready for a value-packed interview, listen on. Here's your host, Eric Sue. How many of you have experienced making a bad hire or had bad hires on your team? I personally lost over $840,000 on just one bad hire alone. So that's why I'm doing a free class called the five secrets to avoiding bad hires that can cost you $50,000 plus each. All you need to do is to text bad hire, spell it out, B-A-D-H-I-R-E to 33444. That's double three, triple four, and you'll be registered. I'll see you there. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Growth Everywhere, where we interview entrepreneurs and bring you business and personal growth tips. Today, we have Sebastian Klein, who's the co-founder of Blinkist, which is pretty much modern cliff notes for the latest and greatest business books. Sebastian, how are you doing today? I'm very fine, thanks. Cool, Sebastian. So why don't you talk a little bit about your background and how it led up to Blinkist, and then we'll go from there. Great, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about it. So I have a background in psychology. I studied at a university and um, I was always reading a ton of business books and self-help books and really enjoyed what I could get out of them. And um, when I and also my co-founders um, who have a business background, when we started working, I went into management consulting, worked for Boston Consulting, had these crazy weeks, 70, 80 hours, and then I really didn't manage to read a single book in a month I, at, from then. And I really realized that it just doesn't work into my busy lifestyle. So I was always thinking it would be great to have a kind of a personal reading assistant, someone who reads all those great books for me and then just gives me the, the key messages. And yeah, that's, that was the basic idea behind Blinkist. And um, three years ago, we quit our jobs and um, started founding this company here in Berlin. Awesome. And how, you know, how are revenues and number of users today? Um, so at, we just hit 100,000 um, euros or $100,000 a month recently. And at the moment, we're growing quite fast and we have um, more than a quarter million users right now. Wow, that's amazing. So, you know what's interesting to me? You know, I've seen stuff like this this in the past and I've downloaded, you know, the, these business summaries. So, you do have competition. So, how do you differ from the competition? What we started with was to try and find like a way of really um, getting summaries away from this old style where you would write a summary that is basically working for you as the person who has read the book and has written the summary. And we tried to get it into a format that really works for the user, like someone who might not have read the book. So what we did is we created this format, which is all about key messages, like single pieces of information that you would be able to digest even without having read the whole book or even intending to read the whole book. And we combined this with like building a product or, on, or apps that is just very pleasant and easy to use and gives you a very nice user experience and makes it rewarding to read those 10, 12 minute summaries. Awesome. And are, do you have any case studies or success stories around this? Regarding our um, yeah, the product. Our form? Yep. Yeah, I mean, we have really very enthusiastic readers around the world. We're now in, we have paying customers in more than 130 countries and get very enthusiastic feedback from people who say, hey guys, I had to, I had to do a presentation about like getting to yes, this book about the Harvard principle of negotiation. And I just used your, uh, I just used your summary to make my slides because every, like every key message is basically the, like you can use it to make one slide because it's just giving you one key insight from from the book or about this principle. And this is just one of the yeah, many great um, case studies we get from our users. Got it. Okay. And just playing devil, devil's advocate here, you know, when I, when I've used stuff like this in the past, you know, my feeling was I didn't get to get the full kind of benefit of the book itself. So do you think, you know, tapering it down takes away from it or does it give you just enough? It depends. I mean, a 10, 15 minute summary never gives you what a whole book with a 10, 15 hours read would give you. That's, that's for sure. And we never, claim to really replace the books um, but there are tons of users that we have who say like I just don't have the time to read all those books so I need a service that gives me the key insights from 
all the books or the best business books and then I can just decide which of which of the topics do I really want to dive into like which of these books do I then buy and read in full and that's actually a very typical use case or, or users are not people who don't read books anymore but they want to make very informed decisions about which topics are exactly the right ones for them. Got it. Okay, cool. I can see how that's, that, that would help people in, in many different ways. Okay, so you know you have a quarter million users right now. You know How did you get your first thousand users? Um, to be honest, we didn't have the greatest start. It took us quite a while to get to like building a building a well functioning product and getting the first one hundred um, summaries out there, because we were all very inexperienced. Never, no one of us has really founded a like a proper company before. And here in Berlin, you don't have as many great mentors and experienced founders as in the US, for example. So it took us quite a while to get to those first thousand. I would say probably one and a half years, and it. I mean, it started with having people here in the startup scene and all personal networks. We had great press com coverage from the beginning because there were always people who just liked the idea of liked our idea in general, even though our product was not that great. They were just writing about it in a very positive way. So yeah, I guess the first thousand were really just fans and people who supported our mission, even though our product wasn't that great and we didn't have that many summaries. Okay, and how long did it take you to get the product, you know, the the MVP up and running? It sounds like it took you a while, right? I just want to get the timeline. The MVP, I would say, was or the MVP was more or less half a year. Then we started, but it was really very rough. Just like forty, fifty summaries in there, a very basic app, and just like iOS only, only in Germany, even only German content. So that that was the MVP. Got it. You know, Jason Lemkin, who uh, talks about software as a service a lot. I mean, you know, you guys have somewhat of a subs subscription model, right? So he says it typically takes two years to really get something like this, you know, get traction going. Uh, do you guys take, you know, is two years about right or was it more or was it less? Two years is a pretty good estimate. Like really a year ago, we had the first phase where we got like proper traction and proper growth through some... Like we had one one great article in Forbes mag in the on uh, like in Forbes online a year ago, which was the first time when we really got like thousands of visitors every day or like a hundred thousand visitors in 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 just one week on our website. And yeah, I would say two years is a pretty good estimate. Got it. Okay. When did you know this thing was going to take off? When did you know you were starting to get traction? Um, I mean, we believed in the idea from the very beginning. We were not super happy with the first like versions of the product that we could launch, but um, we had our international launch like a bit more than a year ago, and from then we had the feeling that, okay, we're getting good feedback from all over the world, and it really seems like we can get there. We can get to the point where like, everybody in our target, target group will, will like what we're doing. Got it. Okay. And what else are you doing today that's unique when it comes to uh, you know, user acquisition? Um, in terms of user acquisition, we had, to be honest, we didn't have um, marketing, especially like a, and like a B2B, uh, B2C customer, a B2B marketing expert in our team from the very beginning. So we had to learn all these things. Um, the first, what worked for us first was content marketing, like writing articles for magazines, for online magazines, because we have all this content. And so we can provide great content for free to publishers. Um, what also works very well for us as email marketing, something that I personally wouldn't have thought a year ago, but it works very well for us. And we're just, we just now the last couple of months, we really found a, a few, a few repeatable marketing channels that seem to work really well for us, like mobile installers, for example. That's that's a very strong driver. Awesome, cool. So the I'm assuming I can just download your mobile app and I could just listen to you know summaries in there. Is that how it works? Exactly. Yeah, you download the app, and then you get three days to try everything for free. You can read all the summaries. You can listen to them. You can create highlights and sync them with your Evernote account. You can even send some summaries to your Kindle. And then yeah, after after a couple of days, we just ask you to either like go for the basic version that is for free, where you can just get one like written book summary per day, or you have to go for one of our um, paid services. Got it. And how much are the paid services? The plus version is fifty dollars a year, and the premium, which includes audio and Evernote integration and the Kindle Sync, is eighty dollars a year at the moment. Wow, that's a good deal for everything, right? Exactly, yeah. And we had this on the one hand, like we really we wanted to make it available to anyone because we don't want to be a like a product for just a small niche of people who can afford such a like a premium service. And but we also had to make it a um, something that people have to pay for because here in Germany, it's really very hard to get funded for several years if you don't have like a clear monetization plan and if you don't start like generate generating revenues very early in 
in your life. Got it. And would you say that's a good thing or a bad thing that, uh, you know, Germany kind of approaches it that way where they maybe they're not quite like the Silicon Valley, you know, uh, the way they approach funding. So do you think that's do you think they're going to change soon? And do you think the way it is is good or bad for you guys? Mm, it's it's really hard to say. I think that we probably won't ever have like a like such a great creative environment where tons of things are tested every year and crazy crazy things are tested and don't happen and other crazy things just happen because somebody believed in the idea or somebody was just willing to fund something even though there was not a clear monetization strategy. I don't think we're ever going to get there, which means that like the business models you will see from Germany will probably always be a bit different to the ones you will see from the US because like thinking about how, how you can make money out of it will be will have to happen much earlier in the in the life cycle. And I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a good or a bad thing, but I think there's a reason why Facebook, Google, and such companies are from the US and not from Germany right now. Got it. Okay. Now let's backtrack a little bit. Let's talk about you know content marketing. So you talked about writing for magazines. You know what type of content are you putting out there to like a Forbes or anything like that? I just I just want to get an idea of what your approach to content marketing looks like. What works really well for us and something where we think we think we can provide a lot of value is because we know all those books and we have read them. It's very easy for us to, for example, say, "Hey, these are the, the seven like really most important pieces of advice you will find in like the fifty best business books of the past decades, or like these are the seven most common or seven most powerful leadership principles that you will find in all these uh, great books from the past year." So this is something we can like really put together and which would be something very hard for someone who first has to read all those books. And uh, th these are the articles that work very well for us in terms of content marketing because they show what we can do and also they show what, what value we can provide with Blink Blinkist. And they're also great content for magazines because usually uh, someone else would have to sit down and read all those books to come up with such an article. Got it. So can you give me like a, like a success story from, let's say you got an art article published on a, on a popular magazine. You know, how many, you know, how many visits and users did you get from like one article? Um, the one I mentioned from Forbes magazine that was really still the by far best, and I think I mean it was read around a hundred a hundred thousand times, and it brought us almost the same number of visitors to a website. Wow. Okay, hundred thousand visitors, and then hundred thousand readers, and how many users did it bring you? Um, we don't know because this was back when we were not very good at tracking yet. Mm, uh, okay. If I, had, if I had to assume, then I would say maybe 500. Wow, that's a home run. 100,000 visits. That's, you know, some websites are lucky to even get that in a year. Yeah, that was really very, a great success and very, very, very good opportunity for us to publish some of our content. Got it. Okay, cool. So the... Let's talk about Holacracy for a minute. And a lot of people probably don't know what Holacracy is. Um, so can you explain what Holacracy is and then we'll, we'll dive a little deeper? Sure, yeah. I mean, it's a pretty complex concept, which is why most people you know, have a hard time getting behind it. And uh, like the general idea is to delete management and job titles and all the traditional stuff that you have in command and control hierarchies and what most companies still are using uh, to remove all of that and just try to create a much more... It's not really democratic because it's still, it still has very clear rules and like very clear responsibilities, but it's a much more flexible approach to having smart people who are all willing to take over um, ownership and want to like, develop their own roles in a company. So it's, it's, a, it's a very flexible way of bringing smart people together and having them produce results that one individual person wouldn't be able to foresee. Like there's not necessarily a plan that one person or just some founders prepare, but more like a collective of very smart people working on the right topics and then coming up with great solutions that nobody could foresee. I would say this is like a very, very short summary. I hope it's it's clear enough. <laughs> cool. No, it, it's, it's a good summary. And I think what we'll do also is we'll, we'll link to Holacracy in the show notes so everyone can check it out. But Holacracy is something that's really interesting because I mean, Zappos, you know, ad adopted it as a whole company. Um, you know, the company I used to work at Treehouse, I think they have a model that's similar as well. I think Valve kind of does the same thing too. Um, so, you know, I've always been, uh, you know, when you don't have titles, when people don't know who to report, like when outside sales teams, they don't know who to contact, people don't know who to talk to, things like that. It sounds like it can get really messy. So how has Holacracy worked for you? And has it been a, you know, a positive or a negative in general? It's been extremely positive. Like people now in our company are really saying this was basically like a, 
uh, like a changing point in our history because they, we became much more effective and much more efficient since then and also people became much more motivated because they could take on more responsibilities and we didn't really adopt the full system because as I said it's very complex and it usually involves a lot of coaching and like you really have to do that takes forever I think to implement and so what I did I was just trying to get behind it and try to understand what the single parts are that it consists of and then just see which of the parts we can use for our company like which of the parts are helping solve problems that we have as an organization and um, I, yeah, what you said that it can become very messy I think that can happen but it's not it's not as I said it's not really democratic you have very clear rules and it, everything is very transparent so if someone for example doesn't perform or doesn't achieve their goals that's very transparent to everybody it's not no longer just transparent to like a single manager or someone they have to report to but it's transparent to everybody and so you get an organization which is getting very good at like getting rid of people that are not not really good enough or not fitting in well enough and just helps everybody make the most out of them and that's that's something very rewarding for me as a founder but also for everybody who's in the company i think Okay. Now, when you when you talk about organizing these, uh, you know, these individual goals for people, you know, where do these goals live? Do they sit in, you know, where do they sit online? What kind of tools are you using and things like that? Just so the audience will know. Yeah, sure. Um, we are big fans of Asana, this um, productivity system. All our company is basically organized in it. And like in a holacracy, you don't have really teams or departments anymore. You would call it a circle. And like a circle means it consists of several roles and each role is then yeah, filled by one person, but every person can have different roles in different circles depending on how much capacity they have, depending on their, their skills. And so all of this is documented in our Asana. And yeah, this is basically how we run. Everything is transparent to everybody. I can look up like every other person's goals, every team's goals, every team's miles, not, not really milestones, but the, um, yeah, the, the, the accomplishments, the accomplishment, accomplishments they want to make in the next month's and yeah, this is this is basically how we organize ourselves. Okay, and I'm assuming in Asana it would be like you know there would be circle one, circle two. People would live in it, and then in that for that individual, it'll show their goals if you click on them and things like that, right? That's how it would look. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And it, I'm just you know I, I think this would definitely be it doesn't have to live in Asana. It could be in Trello. It could be in whatever just whatever tool Absolutely. of choice. It sounds like it, it can go across the board. Okay. Um, so yeah, Holacracy is super interesting. I, I read a lot uh, about it, and yeah, it just seems like. It, I think, you know, if you can work for big companies like Zappos, Treehouse, even startups as well, there has to be a way it can work. Um, and I, I think it'll just continue to be refined over time. And, you know, we'll put the link in the show notes. But I want to switch gears to to hiring for one second. Um, what do you think is your number one hiring secret or tactic? Um, as I said, I'm a psychologist. So I, I studied that for six, six and a half years. And so I have a, a background in really trying to measure and like really trying to make it as objective as possible to like to see what what a person can bring to the company so on the one hand you would always have of course like skills in terms of what kind of languages someone can code or what kind of tools someone can use so that's that's something that is very easy to measure if you have someone who's more senior than the other person but then we always really try to come up with a list of things i mean we have a few standard things like people don't like this term intelligence but i'm basically trying to figure out the like the, like the general intelligence of people before I hire them and I also try to find out other like easy to measure um, components that, that describe someone's someone's working capacity um, but maybe if you ask me about a, like a real secret maybe that's not a secret because other companies are doing it well but we would never hire anyone without having worked with them before so usually would always try to in every case, try to have someone first as a freelancer or just work with them on a project and never really hire someone just on the assumption that they would fit in and that they would do a good job. And what if you desperately need to hire someone? What if someone left and you need to fill the position? We have learned as a company that we it's for us it was really very harmful to hire someone and then have someone who was not a great fit. So we would rather leave a role open and just or try to, to fill it ourselves with just one founder or some other person just jumping in for a while and take the time to properly um, to, yeah, to find someone who's a good fit. And if you ask me what I would do in the next time I found a company, I would definitely hire a very, very good HR person as one of the first 10 employees so someone can really own this process of hiring the right people and finding them and like, talking to uh, prospects very early in the process. Okay, perfect. And what would you say 
is your the biggest hiring disaster you've ever had and what did you learn from it? Mm, just in general, we had our biggest disasters when we tried to hire someone to do something that we didn't really understand ourselves. Like for instance, when we all of us founders had no clue about online marketing, we just tried to find people to do that and it was almost impossible for us to say what does this person have to bring and so there we had like the biggest disaster there was that we just hired like three, four people and all, all of them didn't really fit in and none of them did really work. And then we said, okay, we just have to learn this in the company first. Like the people who are a good fit in the company and are great contributors have to basically learn those skills to a certain level before we can find someone to, yeah, to come to the company as a new employee. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. Now, what would you say is the biggest struggle you faced while growing the business? The biggest struggle. Um, here in Berlin, I would say something very specific for this ecosystem is that um, like you get seed funding very easily, like your first couple of hundred thousand dollars, and then growth money as well. If you have like a proven product and you have repeatable marketing channels and someone then gives you like a couple of millions to, to scale. But um, in between, like as you said, it takes two years to, to, like, to get there to show that there's a, there's a market fit and the product works. So it can happen very easily that you're just running out of money and that nobody is just there who, who will do that kind of investment. So this was, this was basically the only point where we were like almost going out of business because we just thought that, hey, there's no one here who seems to believe in this business anymore. And we didn't, we didn't, know, we didn't know back then that this is more like a fundamental problem in the Berlin startup ecosystem. And yeah, now we, we made it past this point. So now yeah, we can laugh about it. But back then, it was not, not a very nice two months. How dire was that situation? Were you almost out of cash, literally like, you know, like weeks away from being out of cash? Yes, we had to, we even had to stop uh, paying salaries and everybody like that was also a great, uh, it was great to see that all the employees said that they were willing to just wait for the salaries until the new funding is there. Um, that it showed us that everybody had trust in the product and the company. And yeah, so we were, to be quite frankly, we were very close to that. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, and I guess what what is going through your mind during that time when you're almost out of cash? I mean, I mean, I just want to get an idea into you know where, what Sebastian's thinking in general. I usually have the tendency of trying to forget these things later. Um, I mean, we all still thought that hey, this is this is a this is a great product idea, and we're just not there yet where we can show like everybody on the world on the world can use it, and we didn't have the skills to market it. So we were in this situation thinking like, well, it would be such a shame to go out of business now because we think it would just be like, there's still so much potential and we could do it, um, which is why yeah, we, we, kept, yeah, we kept going. And then initially, initially uh, eventually we also yeah, managed to close a deal. Nice. Yeah, I would imagine you know, your product can probably uh, go to the enterprise as well you know, and sell a bunch of seats at once, right? To, sorry, I didn't get that. Yeah, so I, I'm guessing that you can probably do it. I don't know if you guys have done this yet, but I mean, there, there's. Is, tell us about you know the, the B2B play here. Are you guys doing any type of B2B play? Um, we never really focused on that because especially here in Germany, we saw that it's really, it really takes forever to sell something to a company. Um, we now we, we got the first companies who approached us and said, like, hey, this is really great. We want this for all, like our education department or yeah. our department. We, like we closed the first big Silicon Valley company just last month. I'm not sure. I th I'm not sure if we can talk about it, so I'm not mentioning the name. But it's starting. But we haven't focused on it. We said like let's first make it a, a B2C product, and then if this is if we're like well known and people know the brand, then we can start selling to companies. Got it. Okay. Awesome. Um, now, what's one piece of advice you'd give to your 21 year old self? My 21 year old self. Um, I guess I would say be more confident and believe in your own ideas because like, I think when I was younger I was very I, I took criticism very seriously and always thought that there must be something to it and like these days whenever I have like a new idea or something creative I think that okay most people won't like it but just because most, most people don't like new ideas or ideas that they, they are, they're unfam unfamiliar with so I guess yeah I would probably say be more confident about your own ideas okay got it and who would you say is your idol and why? Um, I wouldn't say I have an idol, but I'm always very, very impressed by Jeff Bezos because I think it's just 
uh, like incredible to have someone who's so visionary and just like someone who had this idea of the everything store just before people here in Europe even accepted that the internet was something that would not go away anymore. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm always very much impressed by how yeah how, how great his long term thinking is, and that's something I, I I seriously admire. Cool, love it. Yeah. Um, and what's one productivity hack you can share? Um, I'm using many of them, but I think most of them are pretty common. Uh, maybe one thing I really personally like, I'm always doing this in every meeting I do, also in organizing my circles and organizing myself, and whenever I start a new task, I always force myself or the group I'm working with to first agree on, like, why are we doing this? What is the goal? Like, to, to just have an understanding of what is really the reason why we're doing this and wh where do we want to go with this, which makes it much easier to focus properly and not, like, uh, yeah, drift away or have five people in the room who all have a different understanding of why we're doing this and what's the intended outcome. Okay, makes sense. Do you have like a framework around this people can find online, anything like that? Mm, I mean, it's basically, I mean, probably what I'm saying is based on the idea of outcome thinking and getting things done, where you would always say, yeah. Okay, getting things done, that, that says it all. Okay, perfect. Um, and what's one must-read book you'd recommend to everyone since you have so many books <laughs> in your product? Um, one that I'm, I'm just reading now, so I, I can't tell you about the second half, but the first half I can say about uh, is really, I have the impression that everybody should read it. It's called Conscious Business by Fred Kaufman. And it's, it's, it's pretty complementary to this whole idea of holacracy of building this new or the newest kind of organization um, and conscious business is talking more about the right people, like how, how the right person should be to work in such an environment. And I really like that book, and it, I think it's, it's great to think about this human side of companies more. Got it. Okay. And you said it was conscious business, right? Conscious business, exactly. Perfect. We'll drop that in the show notes as well. So, Sebastian, what is the best way for people to find you online? Just go to our website, Blinkist.com, and um, get your free trial, or just download us in the in the App Store or in the Play Store. Yeah, I guess that's that's the easiest way to find us. You know, there's one thing I noticed before we hop off. Um, I noticed that you know your Twitter was a little difficult to find, and then you. So where is your? You know, is there any? I think you wrote something about Facebook being a killer as well. So you know, talk about social media and how your life relates to that. Um, yeah, you, my Twitter account is very small. Um, I'm, I don't know, this is also something with, with Blinkist, we're not really putting ourselves as people so much in the front room, but just more about the product. And that's also something I really ad admire about, for example, Jeff Bezos, that he's not, he's not him as a person. He, you, you hardly see him because for him, it's more about building this company. Um, I do like social media, but I just use them for my private, private uses. So. You will find you will find me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active there. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, great. Well, Sebastian, you know, thanks first of all for doing this. I think there's a lot of insight, especially on the holacracy part, and I think you opened the eyes for uh, people in the crowd. So, everyone, this is Sebastian Klein of Blinkist, and make sure you check out his website. I think there's a lot uh, everyone can gain from it. It's only fifty bucks a year, or even eighty bucks. So, uh, Sebastian, thanks again. Thank you very much. How many of you have experienced making a bad hire? or had bad hires on your team. I personally lost over $840,000 on just one bad hire alone. So that's why I'm doing a free class called the five secrets to avoiding bad hires that can cost you $50,000 plus each. All you need to do is to text bad hire, spell it out, B-A-D-H-I-R-E to 33444. That's double three, triple four, and you'll be registered. I'll see you there. Thanks for listening to this episode of Growth Everywhere. If you loved what you heard, be sure to head back to growtheverywhere.com for today's show notes and a ton of additional resources. But before you go, hit the subscribe button to avoid missing out on next week's value-packed interview. Enjoy the rest of your week and remember to take action and continue growing.